I will begin by telling you why universities are important as, as, a, as an anchoring point for this conversation. I believe that the thing that we are creating in universities is humanity. And digital disruption has the potential to allow us to create a more educated, a more tolerant, a, tolerant, a more egalitarian and connected humanity. Now, the digital world is changing education. This upheaval makes a lot of people nervous, and other people see great opportunity. I'm in the second group, and I'll tell you why. First of all, digital disruption gives us an opportunity to truly improve the quality of our teaching and our learning, not only online, but also it feeds back on campus. The other important reason why I'm optimistic is that digital disruption is intersecting with the high demand for education, giving us a chance to give more people access to, to knowledge and really create a more connected world. The result is, I think, a society for the better. Now, the question everyone asks is, well, what about the quality? And we all remember the old days of online or, or distance learning, which was the packet and post stuff that was really inferior. And it was the option for people who had no other choice. There was very little support, and it really was fairly average. But even with the improvements in technology and in, in innovation, people still hold some of those negative views of distance education or online education. Uh, and that is something that I want to challenge. Any educational offering can be good or not so good. But with the dramatic improvements in technology and improvements in the new pedagogies and our understandings of how we teach and learn, technology, I believe, is increasing and has the potential, if done right, to increase the quality. Now, most people in this room might have heard of the, the MOOCs, the Massive Open Online Courses. These began only in 2008. In Australia, we've been doing online learning for a long time, but MOOCs became popular in 2008 uh, and is now described as what I would call free, um, low-touch taster courses for people who want information just in time, people who I, I describe as educational tourists who want to just try something. The enrollments are characteristically large. There might be 100,000 people in a course, uh, but only about 10% complete. At first, the quality of the MOOCs was pretty uneven, but through the data analysis and the analytics that are now possible because we're able to, to track and, and collect information about all of those teaching moments, our understanding of how people learn and how to therefore communicate uh, effective teaching has improved a lot and become more tailored. Now, at my university at Swinburne, we have developed recently a few MOOCs aimed at giving people a chance to to, uh, to test whether they're interested in learning through this particular channel. And from that learning, we have learned how to teach better. We know, for example, that people learn by, by learning in smaller modules of information. It's no secret why TED Talks are about seven to 10 minutes. That's about as long as we can pay attention. And if you, know, you think back to the days when you had the sage on the sage stage with, uh, with chalk that would go on for you know, two or three hours of learning, that wasn't quality learning. It was face-to-face, -face, but it wasn't quality stuff. Our primary focus, though, is not on MOOCs. It's on complete undergraduate courses. These are high-touch, high-quality, very interactive courses. Approximately 65% of people complete, and it's getting better as we learn more about how to keep people engaged. So instead of 10% completing, we're one of the, the highest in the sector. The exams and the assessments that people complete are the same as the courses that people take on campus. We're deeply committed to quality and the equivalence of those courses, so an employer wouldn't know if you were educated online or in an on-campus setting. And the university regulator, or TEXA, holds us to this. Interestingly, our online cohort are our happiest students. They are 95% satisfied with the quality of the education they're receiving because it's so personalized and interactive. But this is changing the way we teach. We have to have education advisors available from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., Monday to Friday, and 10 to 6 on weekends. We have uh, created new roles for educational technologists. We have brought in people who understand gamification so we can package and, and understand how to communicate concepts in a more varied and personal way. Others are also embarking on online learning. We've had a long history of people at Deakin University, Curtin University, Charles Sturt University, and UNE doing this work. And more recently, Georgia Tech University has added in online full courses rather than just MOOCs. They're calling them MOODs. 
I think that means massive open, uh, open degrees. Now, we recognize that some people still prefer an on-campus experience, but even these students are benefiting from our, our learnings in online innovation because it gives more flexibility to the way they learn. Some might want to take a couple of courses on campus, some might want to fit in some online because it suits their busy lifestyle. The second key benefit for online learning is access. We are reaching students now who are time poor, have family and work commitments, or who live in areas that are not well served by universities. Our personal data shows that 75% of our students who study fully online are women. 25% are from rural or regional areas. 24% are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And the average age of our fully online students is 33. Now you would see that these are students who would not otherwise touch a campus. And we are reaching out and giving them an opportunity to transform their lives. The changes that I've described will have enormous impacts on universities, but I can characterize them in three ways. First of all, there no longer is the, uh, the notion that knowledge is reserved for a few lucky ones who find themselves to the privileged ivory tower. In fact, disrupt disrupt disruptive uh, digital technologies are really becoming a force for democratization of knowledge. The second major impact is that we're learning that what we teach is more important, or that what we teach is less important than how we teach. And the third learning is that unless we embrace these changes, economic viability of universities is threatened. Now, our society has been there before at this juncture of disruption. We've seen pain in the retail, music, newspaper, and book industries, and change generally provokes discomfort and denial is a normal response. Book publishers never thought that people would read on screen, and newspapers never thought people would accept this commoditized news content from a few sources. Similarly, many of my counterparts believe that prospective students will never forgo the live experience for online learning, but the data shows that they're wrong. If they remain in denial, they risk their own Kodak moment. The promise, therefore, lies in, in this unsettled stage in really reflecting on the opportunity to deeply understand how we teach and how people learn, to understand quality and to pay attention to how we can give people access. A famous quote has relevance here. Education is not the filling of pails, but the lighting of a fire. If we are examining our previous focus on imparting content, we are now asking ourselves, are we really filling pails or are we lighting fires? We're looking at the question of how do we disseminate information and combine that with experience, dialogue, reflection, and study to create meaningful learning. And so we ask for ourselves, uh, what will the future of a university look like? I think we have an opportunity to be more responsive and more engaged to our students and our communities. I think we have an opportunity to be not bound by time and place. I'll never build another lecture theater again, but I will invest more in, in uh, IT infrastructure. We will be more inclusive, I hope, and more responsive to disadvantaged and marginalized groups will continue to be a trusted source of evidence, and we will remain inquiry-driven. But I hope we will be more professionally attuned and more humanely connected. And finally, the connections made possible through digital innovation will allow universities to more actively respond to our global responsibilities seriously, offering accessible, trusted education that builds a connected future. Thank you.